These are some notes from the North Shields Evangelical Church Bible Study uh, on Psalm 63, Psalm 63, which I'm going to read for us now from the ESV translation. O oh God, sorry, a Psalm of David, when he was in the wilderness of Judah. O oh God, you are my God, earnestly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you, my flesh faints for you as in a dry and weary land, where there is no water. So I have looked upon you in the sanctuary, beholding your power and glory. Because your steadfast love is better than life, my lips will praise you. So I will bless you as long as I live. In your name I will lift up my hand. My soul will be satisfied as with fat and rich food, and my mouth will praise you with joyful lips. When I remember you upon my bed and meditate on you in the watches of the night, for you have been my help and in the shadow of your wings I will sing for joy. My soul clings to you, your right hand upholds me. But those who seek to destroy my life shall go down into the depths of the earth. They shall be given over to the power of the sword. They shall be a portion for jackals. But the king shall rejoice in God. All who swear by him shall exult, for the mouths of liars will be stopped. I'm just going to read that subheading to that psalm again. A psalm of David when he was in the desert or the wilderness of Judah. I want you to think, what was the distance between David and water at that time? How many rain clouds would David have been able to see? How many days would he have been had to wait for it to rain? How many miles would he have to walk to reach a water source? I don't know, but if you use an online weather forecast, you'll for be familiar with how they often give you an hour by hour percentage chance of rain. The day I prepared this Bible study, I checked the weather in Jerusalem and there was a 0% zero percent ch chance of rain every hour of every day for the next seven days. And yet David, David was in the desert of Judah, a much, much drier place. The distance between David and water was absolutely massive and he uses that distance to reflect on how distant he felt from the Lord. O oh God, you are my God, earnestly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you, my flesh faints for you, as in a dry and weary land where there is no water. David's thirst for God was as dry as his tongue. He felt as distant from God as he was distant from water. I want you to think, what does that term distant from God, what does it exactly mean? God has no physical form, so feeling distant from God has nothing to do with geography or being able to see him. What does feeling distant from God mean in actual practical terms? Well, David reflects on his strong awareness of God in the past in verse 2. I have seen you in the sanctuary and beheld your power and your glory. In the past, David in the past, David reminds himself that he had had a great awareness of God's power and glory. God knew, David knew that God was powerful, glorious, wise, just and good. But his awareness of these his awareness of God's attributes was a lot lower now. For example, David knew that God was powerful, but he was presently experiencing unanswered prayers. An unanswered prayer can make us feel, feel as if God is not powerful or isn't listening. David knew that God was wise, but he was at this time, he couldn't see God's wisdom. David was asking why God was allowing him to go through this. 
Why was this happening? It didn't make any sense. When we struggle to sense of when we struggle to make sense of why God allows certain things to happen, it makes us feel distant from God because God is wise and our situation just doesn't, doesn't make any sense. David knew that God was loving, but it must have been hard for David to feel loved when most of Israel wanted to slit his throat. And why wasn't, if God is loving, why wasn't the God who loved him intervening? And it's the same way when bad things happen to us, we might feel as if God has abandoned us and left us on our, on our own. David knew that God was merciful. God helps the weak. Yet David felt weak. And, he, <clears throat> and when we feel at our weaker, weakest, we question if God has withdrawn his helping hand. David knew that God was faithful. God had promised David that he'd be king over Israel. But currently, over half of Israel was seeking David's life. God, no, good, did, God did not seem to be being faithful to his promises. David knew that God was eternal. David had seen God at work in the past. David knew that God had promised, it, promised great things in the future. But David was left asking, if God is eternal, where is he now? Why isn't God working, intervening in my life now, today? David knew that God was just, but David was experiencing injustice. And when we see injustice, and we, we often ask, where is God in this situation? Why is he allowing to happen in this? this? Why is he allowing this to happen? Has God upped and left? The fact that David's prayer in the Bible is in the Bible suggests that God expects us to be able to relate to some of these feelings, some of these feelings of distance. Thankfully, within David's prayer, we're also pointed to things that we can do to increase our confidence in God again. In verse 8, David says, My soul clings to you. Your right hand upholds me. The God who David in verse 1 describes as distant. The God who is described as distant is now described as near enough for David to cling to him. Near enough to withhold, uphold David with his righteous right hand. Whatever David had done in, verse, in the five verses between verse 1 and verse 8, whatever David had done had certainly helped. So what, what had David done in these verses in between? These things that had helped him go from feeling distant from God to feeling God was near. Well, five times in these verses, David is pictured praising God, raising his voice and hands in response to who God is. And two times, two times David is pictured spending a prolonged period of time thinking about God, bringing his thoughts from other things to God and meditating all the examples of God's attributes that we thought about before. David, David went from feeling distant from God to feeling close to God because he changed, changed the way he thought. David knew in 1000 BC what psychologists now know in 2000 AD. The things we speak to ourselves have a massive impact on the way we think and the, and the way that we feel. And even though praise, praise is something spoken to God, even though praise is spoken to God, it focuses our minds in God's direction. So it makes sense that lifting our eyes from our circumstances towards God, it makes sense that this will be of great psychological benefit. But is there anything more to it than that? After all, placebo has a psychological benefit, but there's nothing, nothing solid to it. Is praising God nothing more than placebo? Fooling our minds into believing things about God that are just not true. Well, every person in life, the religious and the non-religious, every person in life wrestles with the same problem. There is a gap between what they know and what they sometimes feel. A scientist knows that the sun is hot, the hottest thing in the galaxy in the winter 
they don't feel it. There's a gap between what they feel and what they know. A person who has used the same dentist for the last 60 years knows they're in good hands. But when they're sat in the dentist's chair, watching the dentist sharpen his instruments and warm up the drill, they don't feel safe. There is a gap between what they feel and what they know. Now every person tries to bridge this gap, the gap between what they know and what they feel. For example, the scientist, the scientist who feels cold despite knowing the sun is hot, that scientist reminds himself of that day last winter when everywhere was covered in 10 inches of snow. But after four hours of uninterrupted sunshine, all the snow disappeared. The patient in the dentist chair who feels unsafe despite knowing they're in good hands, they stick in the chair, they don't run out the door, they don't let their feelings get the better of them. Instead, they remind themselves of their 100 five-star experiences of that dentist in the last 20 years. In much the same way, praising God isn't a placebo that religious people use to help bring their, them some psychological benefit that has no truth behind it. No, praise is simply bridging the, cap, the gap between what we feel and what we know. Not only did pray, David praise God, but he meditated on God's, God's character as well. Verse 6, on my bed I remember you. I think of you through the watches of the night. Or in the ESV translation, I remember you upon my bed and meditate on you in the watches of the night. David says, on my bed I remember you. Now remember, David wasn't lying in his four-poster bed, protected by the thick walls of his palace when he said this. David was in the desert, exposed to the elements, unprotected from wild animals, vulnerable to the 3,000 troops that Saul had sent on a hunt and a kill, uh, on a hunt and kill mission. However, despite his lack of physical protection, David reminds himself that God is his refuge. Verse 7, because you are my help, I sing in the shadow of your wings. On my bed I remember you, I think of you through the watches of the night. Depending on how many hours of sunlight there were, the night was divided into three or four watches. For a few hours, some would sleep, while some remained on lookout, and then they'd swap. For every hour of darkness, someone was watching, watching for wild animals or watching for military threats or robbers. The safety of the unit depended on them. However, David says he thinks of God through the watches of the night. In other words, his ultimate trust wasn't in the human beings watching over him whilst he was asleep. His ultimate trust was in God. Now, this didn't mean he didn't take practical action to protect himself and his comrades. He set up a night watch rotor and told them to keep their eyes open. But David knew the importance of God's sovereignty and man's responsibility. He set man on watch as if everything depended on them. And also prayed as if everything depended on God. And so David says, I think of you through the watches of the night. Why? Why are all horror movies set at night? Because what you see at night is very limited. Anything can jump out of anywhere. Because you can only see shadows at night, your mind tends to play tricks on you, building up feelings of anxiety and making you fear the worst. And at night, all the worst monsters come out at night. Werewolves, vampires, bogeymen, desert jackals. They're all most active at night. Now if David did not meditate on God through the watches of, his, of the night, his mind would be in quite a state. In much the same way, if we do nothing to deal with our fears about the unseen, our unseen future, if we do nothing to deal with the anxieties that run around our head, 
if we do nothing to deal with that deal with the monster thoughts that follow us around and terrify us. If we do nothing about these things, we're going to be in quite a state as well. We cannot afford to do nothing. We need to take our minds back to God, back to his character, back to his word, back to his promises. And that is what David did. I think of you through the watches of the night. I'm going to tell you a joke from Woody Allen, which I've tweaked slightly. How do you make the future laugh? How do you make the future laugh? Tell it your plans. What we plan very rarely ever happens. I mean, David, David knew that he was going to be king and he probably imagined how it was going to happen. But if but, but there were 15 years passed between David being told he was going to be king and David actually being king. And in that time, David was forced to flee Jerusalem. He was chased by Saul and 3,000 men with swords. David spent most nights sleeping on rocks in caves and in the desert. What David thought might happen certainly did not happen. In much the same way, rarely does the future we imagine for ourselves happen. It's often less smooth, filled with more difficulties, and significantly different. How do you make the future laugh? Tell it your plans. But how do you laugh at your future? Tell it God's plans. Which is what David did, verses 9 to 11. Verse 9. But those who seek to destroy my life shall go down from the depths of the earth. They shall be given over to the power of the sword. They shall be a portion for jackals. But the king shall rejoice in God. All who swear by him shall exult. For the mouths of liars will be stopped. <laughs> David, in these verses, David bridges the gap between his today and his tomorrow. Today, David could see jackals and swords coming, seeking his harm. But David remembers the future day when his situation would be reversed. Those who want to kill me will be destroyed. They will be given over to the sword and become food for jackals. Today, David could see how his plans, smooth, easy, difficult, free plans. Today, David could see how his plans had gone to pot. But David reminded himself that God's plans, God's promises would be fulfilled. But the king will rejoice in God. All who swear by God will glory in him, while the mouths of liars will be silenced. Now there's significant evidence to suggest that David wrote Psalm 63 when he was in the wilderness, fleeing from King Saul. In other words, David wrote Psalm 63 before he was crowned as king. But despite not being king, David is confident that God's plan for him would be fulfilled. But the king will rejoice in God. How do you make the future laugh? Tell it your plans. How do you laugh at your future? Tell it God's plans. Now, the things that in our futures that will uh, cause us difficulty, the things that afflict you, they're not insignificant. We might laugh or try our best to laugh about them, but we cannot laugh in all honesty. They cause a significant amount of physical pain and mental anguish. But when you laugh not about something, but when you laugh at something, you reduce its size. If someone laughs at someone, it makes them feel small. So remembering God's future has the same effect. When we remember the plans God has for us in the future, the things he has promised, it helps reduce the impact of the things that are afflicting us today, even if it's just a little. In the future, there will be a reversal of our circumstances. In the future, all of God's promises towards us will be fulfilled. 